दोस्तों हम लोग मीडिया के एक बहुत ही नाजुक दौर से गुजर रहे हैं और मीडिया को लेके अनेक भ्रांतियां हैं अनेक बातें कही जाती हैं लोग इल्ज़ाम लगाते हैं कि मीडिया बायस्ड है किसी को सपोर्ट कर रहा है तो एक मीडिया के लिए ये कह सकते हैं कि भ्रांतियों का और एक अजीब सा दौर चल रहा है और हमारे बीच में यहाँ पर सिद्धार्थ वरद राजन हैं जो आज आपको इन भ्रांतियों से निकालने में मदद करेंगे और हमें रास्ते बताएंगे कि किस तरीके से मीडिया का जो यकीन जो विश्वास हम लोगों ने कई सालों में जाकर कायम किया था उसे फिर से किस तरीके से बनाया जा सकता है सिद्धार्थ आपका स्वागत है Hi everybody it's great to be back at talk journalism i think i came here last few years ago and really enjoyed the interaction i had at the time and this program looks fantastic those of you who were lucky enough to come yesterday and who will stay the whole course i'm sure we'll get a lot of it a lot out of it especially those of you who are journalism students and i know that jaipur is um blessed with a number of universities where a lot of you are studying journalism and that's a great thing i look forward to you entering the profession it's a great profession and a great career forget what you heard about salaries of 2 crore uh, i'm one of those journalists or editors who uh, definitely does not earn that kind of salary never have never will and i think that the skewed economics of media business is somewhere down the line partly responsible for the subject of my talk today which has to do with the question of faith or trust in journalism and the reason this is such an important topic is because it has become apparent for some time now that the level of faith or trust that people have in the media has has declined i'm not sure how high it was historically i think people have always been skeptical of the newspapers and television news channels that they watch perhaps with good reason always but today both in india and abroad we are faced with the reality of public distrust and the reasons for this are not hard to find because in india you have a proliferation of media platforms of one kind or the other you have of course the well established legacy media brands the big newspapers big tv channels you have a large number of websites i happen to run one the wire there are lots of others and you have individuals who do a great job in the manner in which they use platforms like youtube or other social media uh platforms in order to to do the work of journalism so there is there are a bewildering array of choices that people have of course we know from surveys and studies that the the big newspapers and the big tv channels attract the lion's share of of uh, of eyeballs even in the digital sphere and on whatever basis people make their decision to read something or not read or to watch or not watch the fact is that there is growing public disenchantment with uh the state of media 
And, you know, frankly, the reasons are not hard to find. Because as a practicing journalist, as somebody who reads newspapers, websites, I don't watch so much of news television uh, anymore, and I'll tell you the reasons why. Uh, it's not difficult to understand why the public feels disenchanted. The fact is that in our mind, in our dem democratic imagination, the media is an essential component of what makes India a democracy. If electoral democracies revolve around elections every four or five years, people are not satisfied with having a say just uh, in this fashion and with such a huge interval of time. People want a say, people want accountability, people want to hold those who are in power responsible for the promises they make, for the deeds that they do, or what they don't do. And whether we like it or not, the media is an important element in the ability of a citizen to hold her government accountable, to hold her leaders accountable, to ask the kind of questions that need to be asked from the people who ask for our votes, from the people who levy taxes, from the people who take decisions of war and peace. And a major part of the public disenchantment with the media is that, frankly, the major section of media in India has stopped doing, has stopped performing that function. One could argue that many of them never played that role. But today, the failure of the media to ask questions of those who are in power, to report on what is happening on the ground, to bring you stories that open a window to the reality of India, not some imagination, not some imagined new India that we are told is being built, but what's actually happening on the ground. It's that failure which is the single major cause of public disenchantment with the media, the lack of faith, the lack of trust. Now, this may not manifest itself in concrete surveys. If you, if you look at the Reuters survey of trust in the media, for example, some of the largest brands have some of the highest trust ratings. And that's not surprising. People consume media for a variety of reasons. There's force of habit. And which person who is a regular reader of Times of India, or who regularly watches, say, India Today TV, is going to admit to a survey that I read this paper every day, but I don't trust it. Or I watch this news channel every day, but I have zero faith in it. So there is a certain momentum, inertia, that legacy brands carry with them. But if you look at their actual performance, you can see that they do not deliver on the promise of actually reporting what is happening, honestly, objectively, dispassionately. I'll give you a small example. All of you are familiar with the controversy about the um, illegal bar license that a restaurant, Goa, is supposed to have acquired, and they were served a notice by the excise commissioner of Goa. Now, when the RTI papers first came to me, I was, you know, frankly, as an editor, uh, quite skeptical. Okay, and I'm an editor who is, uh, you know, I don't, I don't care if a story is going to annoy the government or not. You know, frankly, a story is a story. But I thought, yeah, you know, in this country, bar licenses, restaurant licenses are such a difficult uh, area to negotiate. Somebody may have cut corners. What's the big deal? Is there a story? I wasn't very sure there was a story, but I asked a reporter, just look into this. 
By the evening, the excise commissioner had, first the RTI query came, but by evening the excise commissioner had formally served notice on the restaurant, so it became a story, right? And everybody reported it, or many people reported it. And the connections between the restaurant and the daughter of Smithy Rani were available on social media. Yet, when Smithy Rani holds a so-called press conference that night, as is her right, because she should, if she's accused, have the ability to respond. You know what struck me the most? It was not that she said what she said. Politicians will always find ways to defend themselves. But there were 10 camera, I mean, there were 10 microphones in front of her. I didn't hear a single question. And it was the most obvious question. She had said that my daughter is a student, she has nothing to do with this restaurant. But you have an interview that the daughter gave where she nods in acknowledgement when she's asked, is this your restaurant? And more than that, you have an Instagram post by the same minister who today says my daughter has nothing to do with the restaurant, where she says she's so proud. And she posts a you know, review of, of that restaurant. Very obvious question to ask. that ma'am, you say this, you say you have no connection, but can you tell us why you posted what you did on Instagram? Maybe she has an answer. But the fact that 10 TV channels or other people were there at this so-called press conference, only to record what she said. Is that our job? Are we stenographers? Nobody bothered to ask a question, and this is a pattern that we see over and over and over again. You remember that photograph of Mr. Modi from 2014 or 2015? Holi Milan or Diwali Milan at the BJP office, where everybody is crowding around him to take selfies. Now, every reporter who was invited to that event was told that Modi ji sawal nahi lenge. Fair enough. But since when has a rule like this stopped any journalist? But nobody wanted to ask anything. So when journalism abdicates its responsibility to ask questions, why should the public have faith in it? Why should the public have trust in it? And the problem in India is compounded by the fact that those journalists who ask questions are the guys who get FIRs against them, are the guys like Mohammed Zubair, big hero of Indian journalism today, being arrested in case after case, bogus cases. In one case, he questioned so-called Sudarshan News about why they had, why they were showing a morphed video of the Medina Mosque being attacked in Gaza. And the channel has the nerve to file a case against him, which the police initially refused to register. So the channel somehow convinces, convinces the magistrate, and the magistrate then says an FIR must be registered. Even then the police obviously know that this is a bogus FIR, so they, they register it and take no action. Until the decision obviously comes from high up the food chain, that we have to do what we can to keep Mohammed Zubair in jail, and then all the cases are dredged up, and somebody says, oh, we have this FIR lying in, in uh, uh, I forget which district it was. Bulanshir kaan tha wo? Sahara, ye Sudarshan TV wala. Lakhimpur. And suddenly he is summoned and all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, things are said until finally the Supreme Court put an end to this farce. And Zubair is one example. There was another journalist who died recently actually, committed, he died by suicide in Port Blair. Also Zubair, who was arrested 
in 2020. Why? Because he asked a question of the Port Blair police who had quarantined a family because they had spoken to somebody who was suffering from COVID on the phone. Who's ever heard of this crazy thing, right? You, you quarantine somebody for speaking on the phone. So he asked a question on Twitter that, why have you done this? And he gets arrested and booked under the Epidemic Diseases Act, under Disaster Management Act. He has to go all the way to Calcutta High Court to have the FIR quash, and that takes a whole year. So the next time somebody says, there's a problem with the Indian media, there's lack of faith, lack of trust. There is. And this problem is compounded by the fact that those journalists who believe in doing their job are the ones who are persecuted, are harassed, have cases registered against them. Supriya so Sharma, editor of, of uh, Scroll, goes to Banaras, Prime Minister's constituency, and speaks to people who are not getting the benefits that they're supposed to get, big embarrassment, FIR promptly filed. And then case after case, in every, every, every part of India, Mrinal Pandey, Rajdeep Sadesai, Vinod Joes and others speak about the possibility that the farmer who died in Delhi on January the 26th, 2021, had been shot, get booked for sedition. An editor in Gujarat asks whether Vijay Rupani was going to be replaced as CM, booked for sedition. So, this is the terrain or the atmosphere that we're dealing with which explains, so you need, you need nerves of steel, you need courage. If you are a media organization, you can withstand this pressure only if you aren't dependent on investors, promoters, and advertisers who are scared of the government. And that probably explains why a lot of independent journalism today thrives on the basis of Non-profit companies, smaller companies, companies that depend on subscriptions and donations from the reader, because ultimately it's the reader who has to stand guarantee for the work that we do. There are a couple of other things that I wanted to mention on the question of trust and faith. People often mistake balance with accuracy. What we see on a number of channels in particular are news reports that, of course, they are unbalanced. I don't have too much of an issue with that because every media platform is entitled to its editorial position. When I was editor of The Hindu, we wrote two edits a day where we took a definite view. Government should do that. Government should not do this. Russia should do, should do this. US is wrong to do that, et cetera, et cetera, right? Opinions are fine. There's nothing wrong with an anchor giving her opinion on something. But when opinions are mixed up with news, when you have editorializing of news content, there is a big problem. Because, obviously, somewhere down the line, you are playing around with the accuracy of news reporting. And to my mind, accuracy is the most sacrosanct. Before you report something, you don't have to worry about whether this news shows the Congress in bad light or BJP in bad light, and I must then, therefore, balance it out with something or the other. So if I'm, if I'm running a story which shows that the minister did something bad, then I should also run next to it a story how the Congress is bad. That's bogus equivalence. Every story has to stand or fall on, its, on itself, on its own content. And what we have to do as, as media is to ensure the accuracy of reports. Test 
the veracity of the information that you're publishing or that you're putting out? What is the source of this information? Can you confirm it from some other place? Have you given a chance to the person who will be seen in bad light as a result of the story? Have you given that person a chance to give their response? These are the elements of fair, objective, accurate reporting, all of which goes out of the window in the high-octane, gladiatorial, editorialized news reporting that passes for news on so many of our TV channels. There's nothing like fact-checking in the bulk of these channels. When mistakes are made, they are never acknowledged. When it, when it becomes inevitable that a mistake has to be withdrawn, it will quietly be, the mistake will just be dropped. You will suddenly find articles vanishing from a website, no explanation given. All of this, of course, these are hallmarks of bad journalism, but they are all contributing in one way or the other to the declining levels of public faith and trust. I wanted to end with one or two suggestions. The first, I already said, if media wants to win the confidence and trust of its readers and viewers, separate editorializing and, I mean, separate opinion and, view, and news to the greatest extent possible. That doesn't mean you don't give context, that doesn't mean you don't give background, but do not impose your opinion when, it, when what you are required to do is to report facts. Second, we have found, earlier when I was at the Hindu, now at the, uh, at the Wire, the position of a reader's editor or an ombudsman or an ombudsperson to be very, very useful as, as a device to hold ourselves accountable to our readers. So a reader's editor or an ombudsperson is somebody who is not formally an employee of the organization and hence does not depend for their salary on writing what pleases the editor. Their job is to process complaints, comments, views from readers or viewers, and write about them, adjudicate on them if there's a complaint, investigate if there is a serious complaint, and, and of course, listen to our point of view as well, but then pass an independent judgment on that. And I think more and more newspapers and TV channels a couple of them toyed with the idea. I remember Times of India back in the day had Justice Bhagwati briefly as an ombudsman. NDTV had somebody. But uh, it's not enough for channels to um, subscribe to the broadcast authority, the different trade bodies, because when those bodies give findings very often, they just refuse to implement them. But I think finding some way of being accountable to readers and viewers on a real-time basis, uh, especially through the office of a, a reader's editor or an ombudsperson, uh, is very, very important. Financial transparency. Very often you see news reports or television <laughs> programs that are frankly, they've been sponsored by somebody. In some cases, directly paid for, Often, there's an indirect financial nexus. Um, newspapers and TV channels are not charitable organizations. And I concede that not every nonprofit can, can survive in a, in a crowded marketplace. We manage, perhaps a few others. So media organizations will be driven by the profit motive. But the profit motive does not mean that you cut corners, cut ethical corners in order to make an extra buck. And sadly, what, we, what we've been seeing is that a number of newspapers, number of TV channels 
are selling content. And this has been documented by the press council. It's been, there have been other studies on this. Selling content, this is particularly horrible when it happens at election time. Because the candidate who pays is willing to pay a premium for a news item that projects his or her candidature as opposed to simply placing an ad because readers have a way of discounting whatever information is given in, a, in something that looks like an ad. So the trick is to make the news not look like an ad. So I think it's important that newspapers and TV channels be tra as transparent as possible about their funding. There was a proposal a few years ago from uh, the, I think there was a report by the um, Administrative Staff College of India in Hyderabad and then also a report by TRI when Mr. Kuller was in charge, which looked at the question of cross-ownership of media and raised some interesting proposals about newspapers and TV channels being transparent about uh, their funding sources particularly the advertising tariff cards, which is a great um, you know, source of, of, of foul play. And I think in the absence of that kind of financial transparency, this problem of trust will always, be, will always remain. You, you're never quite sure who is the piper who's calling the tune. In some cases, it's very blatant. You, you look at some of these channels. I mentioned Sudarshan TV. And you have ads from the Uttar Pradesh government, from the, from the central government, and you know what the nexus is. But sometimes the nexus may not be apparent. So I think it's important that there be transparency at, at that level. And my final thought is that at the end of the day, if media has to fulfill the role that it's meant to in a democracy, which is to be the eyes and ears of the public, then it must cultivate a new social contract, if you will, with its readers and viewers, with citizens. People have to be willing to pay a basic minimum for news which serves such an important function in our society. We want media to ask tough questions. We want media to go all around the country and report on those difficult stories. We want the media to give us analysis, insight about what is happening. We want media to serve as a platform for healthy debate. But all of that costs money. And I think those media, it's not a coincidence that those media platforms which have managed to develop a relationship with their reader or their viewer to the point where it's the reader and the viewer who are largely paying for the work that they do. It's not a coincidence that these media organizations are much more independent than those who are dependent on investors whose arms can be twisted, advertisers whose arms can be twisted or who, or who have agendas of their own, or of course, dependent on the government, which is the worst case scenario. And there are many, many media organizations uh, which have that uh, kind of relationship. So I think that financial independence and the, the reader slash viewer slash citizen stake in contributing towards financial independence of media is an absolutely essential component to this uh, uh, challenge of ensuring that um, there is a relationship of faith and trust between the citizen and her newspaper or website or TV channel. Thank you very much. Hello. Siddharth, sir? Yeah. Sir, uh, thank you very much for being very honest in terms of uh, putting the re real picture of Indian media today. Uh, trust issue, faith in media, journalism, everything is going down. 
Sir, I represent Vanasthali Vidyapeet, and my question to you is, how long this state of media will be there? Because when we teach our students, we always find that at the end of the day, their heroes are not there from journalism or media studies. The kind of trust issue that's swirling around in media, and all the robust institutions of democracy are under scanner. The fourth state, which is considered traditionally the media, is also under scanner in nowadays. When we teach our students, our students always ask us, sir, will we become part of this media when we are not that much sure about it? So as uh, teachers, as, as, as faculty members, we always find ourselves in very dilemmatic condition. So how actually should we uh, you know, instill in them a sense of responsibility, a sense of ethical journalism that has to be followed by our students? But we always uh, become very much dilemmatic because at the end of the day, they are not that much comfortable with this kind of state that goes on. Yeah, so I got the question. So I can respond. It's a great question. It's a question I often get asked when I speak at, um, at universities and campuses. And it's often a question that, journal, that the students themselves ask, that why should we enter this profession? What, what hope do we have? What future do we have? And in my view, you have a great future. Because this is, this, is a, this is a profession where I can, I, can, I can give you 20, 30 names off the top of my head of, uh, of people who are role models and who should be role models for young journalists, who work for organizations big and small, or who work, who are freelance. I can think of uh, people in every state of India, working in different languages, who have mastered the art of reporting, of storytelling, of photography, of using their phone as a weapon, as a camera, in order to capture stories that need capturing, and who also are savvy enough to know how to disseminate, put the word out. They may not earn that two crore salary, and thank God for that. But they are doing the work that those two crore guys aren't doing. And thank God for that. And, you know, all of you in journalism school have the ability, you have the tools, I don't think there's any problem of ethics, quite frankly, because every young journalism student I've met coming out of uh, these universities is, is, understands the great responsibility and burden that they carry with them. They, are, they want to become journalists because they see the value of the work for society, for democracy. What, what, what spoils the game is the work culture and the editorial culture and the ethical culture of many of the media organizations that they end up joining. And I've seen over 10, 15 years promising young kids who have joined and don't know how to deal with that pressure and who either get fed up and leave or are able to, and this is an important point to bear in mind, that no matter how rotten the media organization is that you work for, it's still important that you stand your ground, take a stand, do what's right, don't allow somebody to force you to misreport, don't make it harder for the bad guys to corrupt journalism, and if at some point you have to leave, then you leave. So I think that there's plenty of work to be done, may not be remunerative, as, as remunerative, although I think people have shown the way that a lot of individual uh, reporters are using uh, YouTube, for example. People have shown that you can make a living out of this. So there are still plenty of news organizations where you, where you should apply to work and you can find work and you will find satisfying work. There's plenty of scope to work as, as, as a freelance reporter. When I joined the Times of India in 95, there was hardly much of a, there wasn't a very robust freelancer system in India. 
and it was very difficult for them to survive. Today, I know brilliant, hugely capable and qualified journalists who prefer to be freelance because that gives them the freedom to pursue stories that they believe in. And those stories are so good that everybody falls over in, in try, trying to get hold of those stories for themselves. So I think don't let anything that I've said uh, put you off the career path that you've chosen. I think there's a lot of work to be done and I'm certainly looking forward to the day that you guys will emerge as, as, uh, as working journalists in whatever capacity because uh, uh, definitely the field, this profession needs you. So I'm not pessimistic, sir. Yeah. Siddharth, sir, you have been working in the media and in the media, which has been working in the media, and you have been working in the media. In the media, you have been working in the media, and you have been working in the media. But in this picture, there is another picture that comes to me in front of me. वो तस्वीर ये है कि मीडिया का बहुत तेजी से विस्तार हो रहा है। आपके इस सत्र से ठीक पहले एक मीडिया बैरन अपने साम्राज्य के विस्तार की महागाथा हमको बता कर गए हैं। और आपने जो 95 से अपने करियर की शुरुआत की बात की, तब से अब तक मीडिया में कितना फैला हुआ है ये हम सब लोग जानते हैं। अब ये जो सारा उसके बीच में सच्चाई तो दब जाती है और ऐसे लोग समाज में बहुत कम हैं जो सही और गलत के बीच में विवेक कर पाएं बहुत थोड़े से लोग हैं जो यहाँ टॉक जर्नलिज्म में आकर इस तरह की बातें कर रहे हैं वरना तो एक सामान्य आदमी के लिए अखबार में छप जाना या टीवी के चैनल पर कोई बात आ जाना वो वेद वाक्य होता है तो ये जो एक परिदृश्य बन रहा है कि हम सब के ऊपर इतना सारा झूठ इतना सारा प्रचार इतना प्रचार उंडेला जा रहा है इसके बीच में से हमारे उबरने की कम है। जाहिर है कि हर कोई शायद खुल के बोल नहीं पाता। लोगों की अपनी-अपनी बाधाएं हैं, अपनी-अपनी सीमाएं हैं। बहुत सारे लोग अपने जिस मैक में या जिस इदारे में काम करते हैं, उनकी अपनी एक उसकी अपनी एक अनुशासन के तहत वो अपने हाथ पैर को बंधे हुए महस� मैं उस तरह से आजाद हूँ क्योंकि जिस महक में के लिए मैं काम करता हूँ ये एक नॉन प्रॉफिट नॉन प्रॉफिट संस्थान है और मतलब इसमें I don't feel any constraint of that kind लेकिन मुझे लगता है कि ये गौर करने वाली बात है कि ये साम्राज्य इन लोगों का फैल रहा है पैसे जो है खूब खर्च किए जा रहे हैं इसके बावजूद क्राइसिस ऑफ � जनता को पूरी तरह से कन्विंस नहीं कर पा रहे। कुछ महीने पहले ग्रुप ऑफ मिनिस्टर्स का एक रिपोर्ट आया था मोदी सरकार की, जहाँ पे वो कह रहे हैं कि भाई टीवी पे ये अखबारों पे काबू हमलोग पा चुके हैं, लेकिन ये जो डिजिटल मीडिया है कमबख्त, ये जो है इसमें नैरेटिव जो है कहीं और चला जा रहा है, और उसकी कहीं न कहीं डिजिटल मीडिया पे दबाव डाला जाए। इसके खिलाफ हम लड़ रहे हैं। The Wire अपनी जो न्यूज़ मिनट है, बहुत सारे जो लीफलेट जो लीगल पोर्टल हैं, हम लोगों ने इन रूल्स को चैलेंज किया है। और मुझे उम्मीद है कि उस चैलेंज में हम लोग हमारी जीत होगी। और मेन पॉइंट मुझे लगता है कि ये कि सोशल मीडिया का जो दौर है इसका दुरुपयोग भी हो रहा है सरकार की तरफ से जम के हो रहा है लेकिन सोशल मीडिया छोटे मीडिया आउटलेट्स को अपनी आवाज दूर तक पहुंचाने का एक जरिया भी है इसीलिए सरकार जो है वो हमेशा अब ट्विटर यूट्यूब इन पे दबाव डालने की कोशिश कर रहा है पता नहीं वो किस हद तक सफल होंगे नहीं होंगे हो सकता है कि पूरी तरह से सफल हो जाए, फिर हमको और तौर तरीके निकालने पड़ेंगे। लेकिन आप याद करिए तीस साल पहले का जमाना, आप या हम जैसे या हम जैसे लोग अगर किसी मीडिया दारे से निकल गए मेनस्ट्रीम, so called मेनस्ट्रीम से, तो हमारे सामने विकल्प क्या था? छोटा सा एक रिसाला निकालने, 
200 मतलब एक एक पाक्षिक मैगजीन निकाल लें छोटा सा चंद कॉपी उसके छाप के उसको डिस्ट्रीब्यूट करने की कोशिश करते साइक्लो स्टाइल करते अब जो है क्योंकि डिजिटल ईरा है सच सच्चाई को दबाने की जो कैपेसिटी है सरकार के पास वो आ, मतलब कि इतनी इतनी ज़्यादा नहीं उनके पास है ताकत जितना वो समझते हैं और आ, हमारी भी अपनी जो कैपेसिटी है रिजिस्ट करने के लिए टेक्नोलॉजी को यूज़ करने के लिए और अगर हम इसको रिस्पॉन्सिबली यूज़ करें तो मुझे नहीं लगता कि जो सच्चाई जो हम बताना चाह रहे हैं और जो लोग चाहते हैं उसको ये लोग दबा पाएंगे शुक्रिया be and remain inspired and don't give in to negativity thank you thank you so much siddharth bahut acha session aapne liya aur main ek baat ki khaas taur se tareef karunga ki hindi urdu english teenon zabanon pe jo aapka jis tarike se aap bolte hain wo bahut acha hai aur ye journalism ke liye bahut acha sign hai ki sari zabanon pe aapka अच्छा कंट्रोल हो मैं यहाँ पे टिम्मी मैम से रिक्वेस्ट करूँगा कि स्टेज पर आएँ और मोमेंटो दें सिद्धार्थ को टिम्मी मैम हेल्प इन सफरिंग चलाती हैं एनिमल्स की केयर्स को और उनके वेलफेयर को लेके बहुत बड़ी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन हमारे राजस्थान में जयपुर में और इसके अलावा क्लाक सामिर जो हमारा वेन्यू पार्टनर है उसकी भी आप करता धरता हैं मैम स्वागत है आपका 